Good afternoon and hello everyone. My name is Liz Cartland. I'm the Director of Individual Giving at the Harvard Art Museums and it is my pleasure today to welcome you to today's Fellows Program, COVID in the Curriculum, Teaching with Objects Related to Health. Before we begin, we wish to pay tribute to the original inhabitants of the land that Harvard resides on through the reading of a formal land acknowledgement. The Harvard Art Museums acknowledge that Harvard University is situated on the traditional and ancestral territory of the Massachusetts people, and we strive to honor this relationship. Even as we're looking forward to welcome you back in the museum soon, we have really relished these occasions to be together virtually. We so appreciate you carving out time to join us. It means a lot, and it is always great to see you. Today is just one of the many online fellows programs we have lined up in the weeks and months ahead. And as always, invitations will be sent in, ad in advance of each one. And we'll hope you'll save the dates and plan to join us often. In addition, we continue to encourage you to visit the Harvard Art Museum from Home section on our website where even more event opportunities are available. There's museum news and rich content from our curators and conservators. conservators excuse me. I also want to take this opportunity to thank you for your friendship and generosity. The support you provide as fellows is vital to all of our efforts in getting through these challenging times and in positioning us as an even stronger institution on the other side. We're extremely grateful. Before we get started, I just have a few housekeeping items. For today's program, we ask that you mute your microphones throughout the talk. Um, there are certain moments when we'll ask you to unmute, but you'll know, you'll know when those are. We've allotted some time at the end to address questions. So if you wanna please hold your questions until you're prompted, that would be great. And you can simply unmute yourself or use the chat function, which we of course will monitor. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's presenters. We're thrilled to be joined by Laura Muir, Jen Thum, and Joanna Seidenstein. Laura is the Associate Director of Academic and Public Programs and the Louise Miller Thayer Research Curator. She works at the Harvard faculty to facilitate teaching with collections, and she oversees curricular installations in the university galleries, as well as a public seminar series in the Museum Art Study Center, which have successfully moved online this year. If you haven't joined us, please keep an eye out for those. It's, it's really quite a treat because you get an art study center experience uh, without having the limitation of 15 people. So please do that if you haven't. And Laura specializes in European modern art and the history of photography. Jen Thumb is the Assistant Director of Academic Engagement and Assistant Research Curator. She's trained as an archaeologist and specialist in Egyptian art and supports a range of teaching, learning, and research activities at the museums involving art from all divisions. She's committed to celebrating and learning at the learning potential of the museum's collection for inter interdisciplinary classes and diverse audiences, which you'll see more about today. Joanna Seidenstein is the Stanley H. Derwood Foundation Curatorial Fellow in the Division of European and American Art. She specializes in 17th century Dutch art with a focus on the work of Rembrandt. At the museum, she's working on an upcoming exhibition of 17th century landscape drawing, which she's co-organizing with Curatorial Research Associate Susan Anderson. And you will hear more about this exhibition in the coming weeks and months, so keep an, keep an eye out for that. And now please join me in welcoming our fantastic presenters. And I will now turn the virtual floor over to Laura. Thank you so much, Liz. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, as we approach the one year mark of working online, we thought it would be a good moment to update you on our pivot to remote teaching. And some of you got a taste of that this spring um, with a session devoted to, uh, excuse me, last spring with a session devoted to water and the environment. We've obviously had to make some changes to the way that we work with faculty and students since the museums have been closed. Uh, but ever since the pandemic started, we have been very actively involved in online teaching. And we want to give you a snapshot of what that's been like. So we'll, we'll then take a close look at how the pandemic has been reflected in our teaching and the way faculty have engaged with the collections. So we'll start with a high altitude view of our work online by looking at some of our teaching data. And for that, I will turn it over to Jen. Thanks so much, Laura. Um, as Laura mentioned, we have gone full steam ahead into online teaching this year. What does that mean exactly? 
Well, over the past two years, every semester, approximately 60 to 70 different courses from across the university have worked with our collections in some way. And we actually had an upward trend um, before the pandemic. So some of the courses that work with us use the collections on their own. Some uh, brainstorm with museum staff to decide what they'd like to do. And many faculty members have museum staff visit their classes to discuss works of art with students. You can see here what moving online mid semester last year initially did to our curricular engagement, but in fall 2020 we bounced back with 45 different Harvard courses working with us. And that level of engagement is pretty remarkable, considering that we haven't even had access to a building and considering that each of us curators conservators and other museum staff only learned how to teach remotely this year. And we expect that the number of collaborations will be about the same this semester. So um, we're really proud of that work uh, for spring 2021 too. These collaborations like our in-person teaching range across the university and across many disciplines. In fall 2020, faculty from 26 different departments used our collections in their teaching. And the diversity of subjects you see here is a typical picture of what we've been doing since the reopening in 2014. So we've done a lot of outreach, but faculty have also reached out to us to collaborate, especially during the pandemic. One reason for that is because we're in this amazing position of having great digital images and information about our collections available online, along with a number of other digital resources that allow students to engage with works of art remotely. And another reason why going remote sent more faculty our way than you might expect is because working with objects offers something visually and intellectually fresh and exciting in the era of Zoom. For faculty, it's the chance to give their students different kinds of sources to learn from and to do so in ways that are really pedagogically diverse. Of course, history of art and architecture is a key partner of ours, but that department only represents about a fifth of our curricular engagement. So we're a key place for art history, but we're also a place for students of other disciplines to work with art as a primary source, to give concrete expression to their ideas, to illustrate their arguments, and to build practical and analytical skills. And we're doing that with partners from departments like Mind, Brain, and Behavior, uh, Earth and Planetary Sciences, and Harvard Business School, which you might not expect. I also want to call out two of our key partners, the Freshman Seminar Program and the General Education or Gen Ed Program. Freshman seminars are designed for first year undergrads to explore areas that interest them in a small class setting. It's usually about a dozen students, and they're offered in pretty much every department. Gen Ed courses center on broad themes that are supposed to stick with students long after they leave Harvard. They're taken by students from a very wide range of academic concentrations, and they usually have pretty large enrollments. Both of these types of classes have the potential for us to reach new students and students who are unfamiliar with art or with museums, and to make them feel welcome at the Harvard Art Museums and a part of our community. Whether we're online or in person, we always start the semester by reaching out to faculty who are teaching these types of courses to see what kinds of connections we can explore to them with works of art. Sometimes we cold email faculty whose courses sound interesting or timely to us. We're very familiar with the course catalog. Um, and that often results in some really brilliant connections, some of which you're gonna hear a bit um, more about today. These are just some of the Harvard courses that museum staff have visited remotely this year. I'm going to give you just a second to let your eyes wander over this fantastic list. There's a lot more that couldn't fit on here. Um, these are some of the exciting ones. And I want to underscore that we really rely on our colleagues in curatorial and conservation to support this teaching. We work together with them to create truly welcoming experiences that make their expertise accessible to students at all levels. And it shows. So in our student feedback, you see some of that here, many students have commented about how effective our online teaching has been and how their virtual visits have made them even more excited to visit the museums in person when we reopen, which is exactly what we were hoping to see. So now I'm going to turn it back to Laura to tell you about a resource she developed for teaching in our current moment.
Thank you, Jen. So last April, I read this Harvard Gazette article, uh, which you see on your screen, about how faculty across the university, from the sciences to the humanities, were thinking of ways to incorporate the COVID-19 pandemic into their teaching. And it inspired me to start compiling a selection of objects related to disease and healing as a resource for this teaching. And this is something that we do on a smaller scale for individual courses, but a COVID related list had the potential to be useful to a broad range of courses, engage new faculty partners and really speak to our current moment. So I started with a list that I had compiled pre-pandemic for a general education course called Infectious Diseases and Social Injustice, taught by faculty at the med school. I then asked colleagues in our various curatorial departments to suggest additional material. We had an existing but really underutilized tool already on our website. Uh, which allowed us to make a collection. And I used that to fairly quickly create this resource, which we called COVID in the collection. And you see it here on your screen and we'll share a link to it at the end of the presentation. But it brings together about a hundred objects that relate to topics, including infectious diseases, epidemiology, medicine, healing, cures, quarantine, public health initiatives and awareness, and mourning and memorials. And it's really a fascinating cross-section of the collection spanning cultures, time periods, and media. And it could have been much, much longer, but it seemed like 100 objects was about um, the right amount was sort of digestible. Um, and then we, as Jen mentioned, we're familiar, very familiar with the course catalog. We combed through um, the course catalog to identify faculty that were teaching related courses and simply emailed a link to this resource um, and shared some of our other uh, resources. Um, but now we'll take a look at a few of the courses that made use of this material. Now we've worked with a number of classes related to health this year, some of which center explicitly on the pandemic, including changes to museum practice in the age of COVID. And for the remainder of our time together, we're going to home in on these three examples, which we feel illustrate the diversity of experiences that we've been able to offer students on the topic of health using works from across the collections. So we'll start with this one, Karen Thornburg's Gen Ed class, Disease, Illness, and Health Through Literature, which pretty much did what it says in the title. Um, this is a class that we worked with in person last year before making the jump to online last semester. And this time it had 64 students, which as you probably know is not a number that we can accommodate all at the same time in the galleries. One of the silver linings to online teaching is that we can reach a much larger group of students at once than we can in person. But the question becomes, how can you really reach that many students at once and give them the chance to participate and engage in a personal way? Well, to start off, we use the COVID in the collections tool that Laura just talked about to give Professor Thornburg's students agency. The students chose all of the works that we looked at for this class, and the graduate students who served as teaching fellows helped to narrow that selection. In this way, we gave some of the decision making over to both the undergraduates and graduate students who could help shape their own experience giving students the chance to choose what they want to learn about during their visit helps us make more equitable use of our collections and suggests that they will be more invested in the experience and more curious. We began as a group with everyone together in one Zoom room like we are right now with curator Susanna Ebbinghaus leading a close look at our ancient Greek stela of a woman dying in childbirth a work that is in storage and was therefore a really good candidate to use with this class. When it has come out in the Art Study Center, it actually has to be um, horizontal. So you don't get the same sense of how it would have been erected in its original archeological context. Susanna was able to zoom in on minute details that spoke to how this object had been recarved and to use images from similar works at other museums to make comparisons. 
And for a class that included students who were concentrating in all kinds of academic subjects, some of whom had never really looked at art before, this close looking as a larger group was their introduction to how to look at a work of art. What questions can you ask? How does the materiality of the work speak to its content? And what information can you find out about a work through the museum's resources? We continued that large group looking with Joanna, who gave students a close look at a work that you're going to see in a minute, so I'm not going to say too much about it. But I do want to point you to the students' comments in the Zoom chat here, where they were actively chiming in. And then we did something different. In the service of giving this large group a chance to interact in a more intimate setting and to share their thoughts verbally, we split up into smaller groups of about eight students using the breakout rooms. Each room looked at just one work that related to the theme of their course for a deeper dive. Some students looked at one of these two works from the turn of the 20th century in the Social Museum collection a poster from the Nashville, Tennessee Board of Health warning about cleanliness and diseases, and a donation card for cooperative workrooms for women in the Boston area. This was a great chance to bring objects from the public health sector into conversation with works of art. And because this class is taught by a faculty member in comparative literature, also a great chance to explore the interplay between text and image. We were even able to show the original context in which the donation card was displayed in the Social Museum 100 years ago. So it's right over here tucked in between a few other materials. Other groups of students looked at one of these two works, prints on the subject of infectious diseases by physician and artist Eric Avery, which are now on long-term loan to us. The one on the left is printed on paper that's made from recycled surgical rags which adds this new material dimension to the subject. The teaching fellows for this class each joined a breakout room and participated in the discussion, which was open-ended, but guided loosely by some general prompts. When students returned to the main room, they shared what they talked about with the rest of the class. They're taking a sense of ownership over the work that they had spent time with and becoming responsible for relaying what they had learned to their peers. My group stayed in the main room with the professor and she recorded our conversation so that she could use it for another group of students in the version of this course that she teaches at Harvard Extension School. So in truth, this material has reached a lot more than 64 students. And I wanna mention briefly here that this was not our largest online class by far. So please do ask me about that later. Now we wanted to give you a taste of what some of that class felt like for students to put you in their shoes. So I'm gonna pass it to Joanna for a close look at one of the works that Professor Thornburg students explored. Thanks so much, Jen. Um, and while I am pulling up my screen here, I'll just say a word as I did for the students uh, when I joined them for this class about my work at the museum and the role that teaching plays within it. So I am the, as Liz said, the Stanley Durwood Foundation Curatorial Fellow in the Division of European and American Art. And I work primarily on the drawings collection. My particular area of expertise is 17th century Dutch art with a focus on the work of Rembrandt. But here at Harvard, I have the opportunity to work on drawings from throughout Europe from the 15th century to the 20th. And I'm responsible for cataloging, researching, and writing on collection objects and new acquisitions, planning rotations of works on paper for our galleries. Um, and as Liz mentioned, I'm co-curating with Susan Anderson uh, a special exhibition of Dutch landscape drawings. Um, and in addition, my role as a fellow uh, involves planning and leading a variety of talks and public programs, and of course, teaching with the collection. And it's all really tremendous, valuable, invaluable, I'd say, experience. Um, but I have to say, for me, the teaching component of the fellowship is, is really one of the most exciting aspects um, because of the direct interaction with the students. Um, as Jen said, not 
not including those who are not already knowledgeable of and interested in art and art history, um, the opportunity to hear their responses to, to our collection and to give them a sense of our professions, um, the institution and, and these works of art, which they might not you know, otherwise encounter. Um, and as Jen said, par participating in this kind of teaching for me involves being directed to objects that might not otherwise be a focus of my research. And the, the class that Jen described is a great example because as she said, the students chose this work for discussion. And you know, it's a print by Rembrandt and so a work I knew well enough, but to look at it in the context of a class focused on illness and health really opened up my own way of thinking about it and made for a really great discussion. And just as I, we hope that looking at this work in the context of that class gave the students a chance to think a little bit differently um, about what they were, were learning. Um, so I hope I can give you all a taste of that um, discussion now. And so I, I'd like to start in the same way I started with, with the students that day and ask you if you would just you know you can call it out loud or put it in the chat, how big do you think this object is? 12 inches, small, Great. Any other thoughts? Like a baseball card. Wonderful. Eight inches. So lots of different thoughts and opinions. Great. It's very, it's very uh, tricky when you see something on a screen. Of course, we all have different size screens. Big enough to comfortably accommodate the signature. Interesting. Indeed. Well, thank you all for, for weighing in. Um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll spare you any further uh, uh, wait and let you know that it is all of three inches tall and about an inch and a half wide. And if I can direct you to, to, to me, to my face on the screen, I'll show you a printout I made to scale. And so you can really see, I will hold it up to a dollar bill so you can see just how tiny it really is. I mean, really, really small. And you can imagine, you know, you can see the, you know, the figure's face compared to George Washington here. It's, it's a lot smaller. So, you know, first of all, we can imagine what it was like for Rembrandt to make this work. It's an etching, a print. So it's something he would have designed on a copper plate with an etching needle. And eventually it would be, the plate would be inked and, and pressed to create multiple impressions in, in reverse. Um, so, you know, he would have had to really, really work in the most incredibly precise fashion um, to produce this work. Um, and then, you know, for those who, who bought it, who owned it, you know, you could, you can, you, you hold it right in the palm of your hand and you'd have to really get close to see it in any kind of detail. So it makes for this really quite intimate encounter with the figure that's depicted here. So I'd love, I'd love to know, you know, what are some words you just, you'd use to describe this figure? You know, if, if you were to have encounter someone like this on the street, um, what would you think, you know, what, what words come to mind? And again, feel free to just call it out or, or put it in the chat. Scruffy, the beard. Yes. Scruffy. That's a good word. Anyone else? Anything else about his, his, uh, you know, facial features or Red, uh, the flamboyant outfit. Yes. Dressed to make an effect. What's that? What's that, Jerry? Dressed to make an effect. Yes. Dressed to make an effect. Thank you. Yes. A flamboyant outfit. Indeed. Great. Anything else about his expression or, or maybe his posture? A peddler, maybe selling something. Great. Yeah. What do you think he is doing? He's got, he's holding something up right in one hand and he's got a basket kind of in front of him that's hanging off his shoulders, confident, comfortable about himself. Very interesting. Very interesting. 
Is he leaning against a wall? Hmm. That, yeah, it's a, he's definitely leaning back, right? He's kind of a little slouch. He's got his arm out, his elbow out, you know, akimbo, which I think does bespeak a kind of confidence, a swagger, right? And I think what he, he, that what you see behind him, that dark area is actually a cape that's hanging off his back. Um, and we don't know what's behind him, whether it's a wall or open space, but it's a very, it's a very good question. He certainly could be leaning against something. There does seem to be the shadows cast by his legs and feet do seem to kind of end and kind of there's a, a, a little bit of a what looks to be like a corner there. So there may, may well be a wall there. Um, yeah, so, you know, this is one of many prints Rembrandt made in the 1630s, early in his career um, of street types, as, as we say, merchants, also beggars, and various other figures one would meet walking around the city, walking around 17th century Amsterdam. And I, I've deliberately withheld the title, but I will, I will reveal it to you now. It is the Quacksalver. Um, and this is an English term, though we're much more familiar with its shortened form, quack, to refer to someone who practices medicine and purports to be a trained medical doctor under false pretenses. Um, and this term actually comes from the Dutch, a, a Dutch the Dutch term quacksalver, which comes from an old Dutch term, quacken, which means to boast, and salve, or which means salve, or a kind of healing, healing ointment. So if we look at our quack salver again here, um, let's talk about that dress that you that many of you noted. Um, what he's wearing is not contemporary 17th century dress. It is a kind of over the top version of of 16th century dress, of Renaissance dress. So you know, a hundred years earlier. So so more than old fashioned. Um, why do you think Rembrandt might have clothed him in this way. It makes him seem even more out of touch with reality. Great. Yeah. Make him seem out of step with modern times. Like a theatrical character. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, he, yeah, I, I agree with all of that. Um, maybe such people did dress that way. Well, that's a very interesting comment too, because indeed, so yes, there were trained physicians in the 17th century. You know, there was a distinction between people who were, you know, medical doctors and those who practiced medicine without that kind of training. Uh, they were actually very limited in terms of what they could do um, professionally in, in 17th century, in, in, in the Netherlands, in the 17th century. And they were actually kind of relegated to fairs and carnivals and you know they would actually sell things and act that would act, purport to actually you know have some medicinal benefit but in a way they were kind of assigned as a kind of performers and even kind of like a you know kind of circus performers so indeed they might have worn clothing that you know, fit with that context. Um, and that might have been part of the appeal even that it wasn't just about what they were selling, but but a spe the spectacle of it, the fun of it, the, you know, even kind of transgressiveness of it. Um, and Rembrandt liked odd costumes and hats. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. For, for an artist who might've seen a figure dressed like that or, uh, you know, imagined it, um, the chance to, to draw that crazy ruff around his neck and the um, rather over the top cod piece and the uh, billowing pants, it must've been a real, a real joy to, to uh, render those details. Um, so I'm just going to show you really briefly the impression of this print from the Rijksmuseum, uh, only because they have such high res, uh, high resolution photography, we can really zoom in. Um, so you can see the details of this kind of incredible line work, again, rendered on this tiny, tiny scale, you can really get a sense of his age. Um, his expression, he's, his mouth is open, he's, I think he's probably talking, you know, kind of trying to say like, this is what I have here. This is why you should buy it. Um, and, you know, we, what, I, what we talked about with the students is the fact that 
Um, oh, holding up a script for height of, yes, hydroxychlor, sorry, chlorine. Thank you for bringing that up because that's exactly, you know, what I was thinking when, when I looked at this print in the context of this class, because, you know, we are at a moment where, you know, we know, we, we can't help but see that there is a lot of uh, false information about, about medicine um, being circulated and a lot of distrust of medicine. Um, and so it really made me look at this work differently, how on one hand, you know, we might be ready to make fun of a figure like this, assume that what he's selling is, you know, of no medical benefit or value of any kind, and that he's, he's, you know, a one not to be trusted somebody that you know is knows he's selling nothing but wanting to just you know make make money um by deceiving us um but of course when it comes to health you know we're, we're not we're not always rational right <laughs> even if we want to be what we're willing to put in or on our bodies you know we we do sometimes look beyond science or away from science we rely on family wisdom um and on medicinal products we can see and smell and so what he's probably holding up is you know a piece of cloth fat you know fabric dipped in ointment of some kind you know something that people could see and think well yeah i could imagine that working i could imagine that helping me as opposed to something like a pill or a vaccine that might be harder for us to understand how how it works um so just to go back to the um overall image um just just to conclude you know i you know like to remind the students because we look we look at you know we looked at this image and and you know what what the content of the image but just you know it's always good to remind remind ourselves that we're looking at a work of art you know one that's made for an audience and as a print made for multiple audiences and can you can you imagine who might have wanted such a work um in the in the period like who might have bought bought such a print or do you think of anybody who might not not want would not want it you know this at this early stage rembrandt is producing prints um already you know for a, a he's already you know a, a name a well-known name and he's producing prints for um a pretty high level clientele though at the same time um making works with with you know wider popular appeal um uh uh, someone who collected other street types. Yeah, absolutely, right? This is one of, of several of these uh, prints, as I mentioned, and, and uh, Rembrandt was also very a very good marketer and would think about, you know, ah, people will want to add this and have the whole set, the whole, you know, the whole series. Um, but it's, it's fun for me to imagine, you know, doctors in the period owning works like these because they probably did and you know maybe for them you know it having this print of this non-doctor was kind of affirming of their own identity or maybe even they could relate in some way because of the distrust that the, that such figures might might inspire so just just a little conjecture uh to to leave you with um, but before I um, pass the baton back to Laura, I'd be happy to take any, uh, you know, one, one or two questions. We can, we can also um, take additional questions at, at the very end of our program today. But anyone have a, a burning question about this work or about the class um, or anything else? Okay, well, well if not, we can, uh, we can resume at the end and I will turn things over to Laura. Thank you so much, Joanna. Um, I want to move on to uh, another class that dealt with these materials. It was called Care in Critical Times, and it was a class taught by Professor Andrea Wright in the Anthropology Department that explored the question, what is care, and how culture, social relations, and systems of power shape the experiences, roles, practices, and interactions of individuals and their communities in the exchange of care. Um, this subject obviously had special re relevance um, in the age of COVID. And Professor Wright's students 
explored uh, the COVID in the collections list and selected a range of objects that they were interested in learning about in a virtual museum visit. And we started with a look at our sculpture, Prince Shotoku at age two. Uh, Shotoku, uh, as you may know, is considered the founder of Japanese Buddhism. And the sculpture is hollow in order to accommodate, accommodate various objects or relics, including a tiny medicine Buddha, as well as healing sutras or texts. And our curator of Japanese art, Rachel Saunders, who you see at the top right of your screen, discussed this sculpture as a way of expanding students' ideas of what constitutes care to incorporate spiritual care. And we discussed the community slash communal aspect of the patronage and use of this object in its original context. We also considered it in relation to a community of care in the museum sense. So the care for or stewardship of the object by networks of curators, researchers, and other specialists, um, as well as the use of medical technologies such as CT scans and x-rays um, in the research of this object. And it generated a really lively conversation with the students. So the next object we looked at was uh, something completely different. Um, Elizabeth Kunreuther's photograph of the AIDS quilt in New York City in 1988. And I led a discussion on how the making of the quilt, its display in various cities and related ceremonies and observances were all part of a collective action meant to draw attention to the severity of the AIDS crisis. Uh, we also discussed how the photograph depicts uh, this physical labor and care of inscribing the names of loved ones and how the object itself, which now comprises around 40,000 panels, which could cover 26 football fields, um, is, is something that needs to be cared for as well as an object. Um, and in research, researching this, I actually um, track down the artist um, who shared her experience of, of making the photograph. And I think, interestingly, she herself is um, involved in the care profession as a social worker, working with individuals with drug and alcohol addictions. I actually found her on the website for her, her current um, affiliation. And the next object we looked at was Francis Benjamin Johnston's photograph of the staff and students who were part of the Tuskegee Institute Hospital and Nurse Training Program at this historically Black college. The program grew out of necessity as this self-sufficient school community grew its own food and provided all of the necessary services um, and needed nurses. So nursing eventually became one of Tuskegee Institute's most important programs um, and provided much needed care for the black community. This work is part of the museum, social museum collection, which you heard a little bit about before. This was a collection established by a Harvard professor around 1900 documenting the work of social reform agencies. And this work, as you can see from the caption was collected as part of a a problematic section titled Agencies Promoting the Assimilation of the Negro. And we ended with a pair of additional works from the Social Museum collection, which documented the facilities at the State Thompson Asylum for Orphan and Destitute Indian Children. And Jen led students in a close look at these two images, which are paired on the original display board to ask questions about what kind of care this represented. And I'll turn it back over to Jen now. Thanks, Laura. So I'm gonna turn finally to our last example today, which is a class that we taught just a few weeks ago. Soha Bayumi's graphic, visualizing medicine from textbooks to comics. So this is a history of science course that focuses on the way medical topics have been conveyed through various types of visual culture. Joanna joined us yet again for this class. Um, she started us off uh, this time discussing an 18th century Dutch study of the interior of a head, which the professor chose, but which Joanna hadn't worked on before. So it was a chance for a bit of new research. 
And you can see in the chat that even the students' initial descriptions of this work were vivid and pointed. The anatomical drawing was followed by curatorial assistant Casey Monahan's discussion of a fairly recent acquisition that just happened to be perfect for this class, La Vaccine en Voyage, which you saw as the header image for this program. This is the last in a series of anti-vaccination prints made by an anonymous artist aimed at dissuading the French public from receiving a new form of inoculation for smallpox. The new vaccine was looked at suspiciously as were those who were profiting from the previous one who were afraid of losing their businesses. In a time of our own anti-vax movements and suspicions about public health measures, the connection could really not be clearer. And finally, with this class, we split in half again into breakout rooms. And again, you used Eric Avery's print on emerging infectious diseases. It's always interesting to see how the same work performs with different techniques of looking and in different curricular contexts. In this case, we took a more structured approach to picking apart the contents of the work than we did with that open questioning for Professor Thornburg's class. In this case, we had each student describe in detail one element that they saw, and then we asked students to toss it to the next student to continue this as sort of a line of thinking so that they would cover all of the ground of everything that they were seeing in, in front of them. Um, and the other breakout room looked at this poster on um, the spread, prevention, and cure of tuberculosis from the Social Museum collection. And since this class is about visuals, in the closing discussion, the two works together presented complementary spatial arrangements of text and image, depictions of signs, symptoms, and diagnoses, and intended audiences. And when we visited this class, it wasn't just to explore firsthand the types of media at the center of their course. It was also to prepare students for an assignment where they're gonna create virtual exhibitions on topics at the intersection of medicine and visuality. And we're really excited to see what they come up with as the semester draws to an end next month. This class was also visited by a librarian from the Countway Library at Harvard Medical School and students are allowed to choose to use some of that material in their exhibitions as well, if they'd like. So we're really thrilled that they're gonna have the chance to make connections across collections at Harvard on the theme of their course. Thank you so much, Jen. In closing, we would like to invite you to join us for a public program on Wednesday, April 28th, that will showcase a recent faculty and course collaboration for the wildly popular course stories from the end of the world, which explores apocalyptic visions. We presented a similar program for faculty last fall, which was very well received. So we thought we'd have a, another go at it. Um, although teaching with the collections is core to our mission and happening all the time, it is often invisible to our public audiences. So we're always happy to have a chance to foreground this work. So thank you all for your attention and we are happy to take questions. And I also wanna mention that we will be sharing links to a number of the resources that we discussed um, in the presentation um, in the chat, I think momentarily and in a follow-up email. But please put questions in the chat or unmute yourself. Jerry, I see you're having- Yeah, I have a question uh, very specific. Um, I know that Eric Avery, who is very involved with art and medicine, as, as you could see from his things, would like to see this whole program. Will this be on the website? I think it's being recorded. So maybe Liz or Ann can speak to Today's program, yes, I'll say today's program is being recorded. Um, it takes a little while to process it, Jerry, but once it is, we're happy to share it with whomever um, we can follow up with you directly to make sure that Eric was best. Thank you. I know he'll want to see it. Okay. Yeah, his work has been a godsend um, in this moment. We have used it, you know, in even more classes. And it's, and I, I understand that he's doing work related to the, the COVID crisis now. He's yeah. still actively yeah. making art. And um, it's been just really incredibly useful um, to us. And it's just great art, too. Well, I'm sure he thinks that you're doing a wonderful thing too by, by what you've uh, produced here and by the teaching. 
I want to draw attention to a, an earlier question in the chat from Joyce. Um, what teaching methods were used uh, that were used while the museum was closed for the construction years were applicable to remote learning? It's not a question that I can answer because I wasn't here then. I started in 2018, but um, maybe that's a question. I'm not Laura, if you are able to answer that one. Actually, I was um, in the Bush Reisinger Museum in a different role at that time. I didn't actually transition to my new role in academic and public programs until um, 2014. Um, so I think it was actually, we were a lot quieter in terms of teaching. Um, I believe that there were courses that came out to Somerville um, to look at materials in storage. Um, we did have installations in the Sackler building. Um, so there, there were certainly teaching that was happening on site in the, in the building, but it was, um, I think, and, and certainly the history of art and architecture department was using the collections as, as they had, but it was, it was um, much quieter, much smaller scale. Um, so the fact that we have been able to really utilize these digital resources and Zoom, um, you know, has been an absolute game changer in ter terms of us being able to continue to be engaged with faculty and students in, in teaching um, during this period. In fact, we've actually run a number of workshops for faculty, especially actually the summer before and uh, right when we moved online uh, this time last year, because a lot of faculty had never taught online before in any capacity. And so we took on this uh, role of doing a little bit of light training for how to interact with objects of any kind in the online space. Um, we started to reflect on how accessibility practices can affect teaching and learning for everyone. So we started doing different kinds of captioning and talking more about size and scale of work. So those influences have really helped the way we work too. One of the links that I put in the chat is to our uh, PDF on our teaching remotely page that's for faculty to get a sense of what we can offer them. And there's some language there about all the different ways they can use us as a resource, even if they're not working with us directly. So you can get a little snapshot of what we've offered them there. Great, I'm just looking for hands. Does anyone else have any questions from this uh, great group today? Oh, it looks like, Bob, do you have a question? Please go ahead and Bob yeah. and, uh, un there you go. <laughs> Once you're in this virtual teaching uh, environment, in principle, you have access to any work of art, wherever it is in any museum. So how, how would you make the choice about whether to feature one that's in the Harvard Art Museum versus as you did one of the Reich Museum or in uh, any of the great museums of the world to have the maximum impact in an academic setting. I think Joanna's example, I would love for you to talk a little bit more about that example, Joanna, um, if you wanna start us off with that. Sure, yeah, it's a great question. And one, you know, I've encountered and in, in kind of putting, you know, these kind of presentations together because there is this kind of sometimes an urge like, oh, that would be good to bring in and that would be good to bring in and you could kind of, you know, make a whole slide um, presentation. Um, you know, I think, you know, of course we want to feature the objects in our collection because we have particular expertise about them and including their, you know, material properties and histories. Um, and so to, to share that with the students and um, of, in, in many cases, these are students who we, we certainly hope will before long be able to come to the museum and see those very same objects. Um, so that's really important. But but at the same time, you know, when when another work, you know, in, in, in the case I in the the, the um, example I showed, where the impression from the Rijksmuseum, which is you know, it's it, there's nothing that different about it, but the image itself allows for um, what we would do in the study center with a magnifying glass. Um, you know, why not bring it in? Um, and there have been, you know, other mm. examples where, you know, another work of art from a, from a different. I'm place. thinking like if you're doing something for the medical school, I remember the wonderful uh, painting by Goya uh, of the operating room and uh, maybe may it wasn't Goya, but there are these vivid images out there of what surgery looked like uh, uh, 200 years ago or 150 years ago. Yeah, absolutely. It's very well captured. Yeah. Yeah, do you think sort of grounding the experience of all these classes in what Harvard has to offer is 
of primary importance because we have this, you know, expectation that people will come back and visit us in person if they're part of the Harvard community and then they can come and experience the work that we have on hand for themselves. Even if it's not on view, they can then request it in the Art Study Center. They can have that in-person experience that they've missed. And that's a unique opportunity for Harvard community members to engage in that way with the works that we have. But I have myself used Comparanda from other museums in fact, I'll give you one good example where it was really instructive. We have uh, an Egyptian artifact that was part of an assemblage of four, the same type. And I tracked down one of the other ones in another museum. So I was able to show the class two that came from the same set and I would never have those two in the same room together normally. Um, so sometimes it really works out quite well. Any other questions? I'm just looking for hands. All right. Well, wonderful. If you think of anything, you know how to be in touch with us. Um, but we really, uh, Laura and Jen and Joanna, thank you so much for such a wonderful program. I think we're all very envious of the students' experience, um, whether whether in person or, or online. And I just want to thank everyone for coming. It's always such a treat to see you. And we really look forward to seeing you next time. And uh, hopefully we see you often in the weeks ahead. So please keep an eye on your email for invitations and wonderful follow-up from this event for more links and more learning. And until then, take care. <laughs>